When we think of fruit flies, we typically think of them buzzing in a very small location. But if you looked at population genetic structure of flies in the American Southwest, you'd see that there was apparently a fair amount of gene flow among different groups of flies that were separated by things like the Mojave Desert. We want to do our best to track these flies. A project that was pitched to me as, we're going to go out in the field and try to figure out how flies fly really long distances. We know from previous work in labs that flies can really only fly for about two hours before they've run out of fuel. So if you want to make it across a stretch of land like that, you've got to book it. A large part of our work is about the wind and how flies might use the wind for their advantage in a problem like this. Our experimental setup was largely a circle. It's a one kilometer radius. And we typically had 10 traps that were evenly spaced around that circle. We would get that all ready to go. We would also go to the center and set up some of our weather sensing equipment. And then we would sleep or you know, try to sleep in the 30 mile an hour winds. And then the subsequent morning, we would release at a minimum 30,000 fruit flies and at a maximum around 200,000 fruit flies. I had outfitted these buckets with Velcro adhered lids. And so there's like this satisfying tear that you do and just a cloud of flies that explodes. It was hard to analyze their performance because we didn't know what their goal was. We can only make some inferences, but what we can say is that flies did arrive in the traps that we had baited with this apple ferment. So it's releasing these plumes of ethanol and CO2 and other like fruity volatiles. It smelled great. We had an aluminum tripod that would hold a camera above the trap, looking down at the trap surface, basically a timer at the finish line. In all but the very windiest conditions, we always caught at least some flies at the upwind and crosswind traps. And then we typically caught quite a few in the downwind traps. So the first finding is that flies do fly upwind in the field, even in the face of winds. And then another finding I think is a lot more subtle regarding the time of the very first flies to arrive at all the traps. We really couldn't find a way to better explain those data, except with this model that indicated that the flies might have an algorithm for dealing with the wind that works well for them in a huge variety of wind conditions. It's really elegant. It allows them to fly long distances while preserving their ability to maybe encounter an odor plume. Because Drosophila melanogaster is not a navigational specialist like a monarch butterfly or an arctic tern, we imagine it's probably drawing from a toolkit, a neurobiological and behavioral toolkit that could be common to most insects. And so we're hoping that our findings might be applicable to a wide variety of insects. 